bullies. We all encounter them on the playground, but what happens when you encounter them not just in your church, but in the pulpit of your church? Welcome to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's. And joining me today to talk about bullies in the pulpit is Paul Coughlin, an expert on bullying and a best-selling author and speaker. Contrary to popular opinion, Paul says bullies aren't typically wounded people who are seeking to ease their pain. They're prideful predators with contempt for others, and the only way to stop them is for bystanders to courageously take a stand. Paul has tons of practical insights for tackling the problem of bullying by pastors, and I can't wait to speak with them. But first, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this podcast, Judson University and Marquardt of Barrington. Judson University is a top-ranked Christian university providing a caring community and an excellent college experience. Plus, the school offers more than 60 majors, great leadership opportunities, and strong financial aid. Judson University is shaping lives that shape the world. For more information, just go to judsonu.edu. Also, if you're looking for a quality new or used car, I highly recommend my friends at Marquardt of Barrington. Marquardt is a Buick GMC dealership where you can expect honesty, integrity, and transparency. That's because the owners there, Dan and Kurt Marquardt, are men of character. To check them out, just go to buyacar123.com. Well, again, joining me today is Paul Coughlin, an expert regarding bullying and a best-selling author and speaker. Paul's books include No More Christian Nice Guy, Free Us from Bullying, and No More Jellyfish, Chickens, or Wimps. Paul has uh, appeared on Good Morning America, Nightline, Fox News, C-SPAN, and I'm so thrilled to have him today on The Roy's Report. So, Paul, welcome. Such a privilege to have you. Julie, I'm thrilled as well. I've been a fan for a long time, and I finally get to be your guest. So thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And a lot of stuff that I want to cover today. And, and a lot of your work deals with bullying among adolescents. But what I specifically want to talk about is bullying in the church and specifically, sadly, uh, among pastors, because that's what so much of my work centers on. So I, I'd like to just sort of start there why is it, Paul, that the church, which is supposed to be a place of healing, a place where we're led by shepherds who care for us, has sadly become a place where there's so much bullying going on? So as we both know, uh, the vast majority of church leaders aren't bullies. Uh, so maybe we start there. Um, but what happens is the damage of a serial bully can be so profound that it ends up making the headlines uh, all across the nation and sometimes uh, even in the world. And the reason why I think we have this is that roughly 15% of a given population will have a bullying mentality. And then the real question is, uh, does it activate? Does it find a soil in which to grow? In regard to the church, it's additionally problematic because we come to church with a lot of presuppositions. And one of them is that if the person is a leader, then they must be uh, kind and generous and wise and certainly not looking to abuse other people. So we have this assumption, and there are those around 15% who use this assumption against other people. And then on top of that, of course, uh, we have a belief, another presupposition, that the, the person that, who is speaking really speaks for God and even represents the character of God. So when we have that, we are really set up for tremendous uh, disaster and harm uh, when we come into a situation like that with those presuppositions, especially when someone knows we have those and uses them against us. And you also say in your book, bullies, or a place that's most dangerous for bullies is a place that attracts people who have nurturing personalities, who really care about people. Talk about that a little bit, because I think there is sort of a setup there for bullies where they notice people who are like that. The areas where uh, bullying could be most profound in a vocation are going to be education, nursing, and ministry. And the reason for that is most attract a more nurturing personality, uh, which is wonderful because those are people-friendly uh, uh, jobs or vocations. 
So, but the problem with that is the nurturing personality doesn't know how to handle a serial bully. The nurturing personality has been led to believe in part through some, a lot of uh, scripture twisting, as well as pop psychology, to uh, believe that all we have to do is love that person more and we will melt their heart. We will uh, kind of make them feel guilty for their behavior mm -hmm. and uh, the, there'll be sunshine and, and roses uh, in the future. And that really isn't the right approach to a serial bully. Serial bullies do not listen to peace, love, and understanding. We wish they did, but they don't. They listen to power and consequences. And I would also argue that though not all liars are serial bullies, all serial bullies lie. Hmm. Every one of them, even if they're holding a Bible, even if they're holding a Bible. And that's tough for the more nurturing personality to understand. And I would argue, and I've seen in the work that we do, that that kind of person is fearful of, of a world where a person might lie to them regularly, so much so that they just won't believe it. And mm. because of that, they will not be able to confront that person well, and they won't be able to serve their church well either. In fact, they, they'll harm their church with being so naive. And there was a time where in the church, it was thought that you couldn't fire somebody for being a bully. In fact, you have a quote that I thought was really interesting by uh, Jimmy Dodd, who's the president of Pastor Serve. And, and he said, and I quote, there was a belief among church leaders that you could fire a guy for moral failure and lack of financial integrity, but couldn't fire a pastor for being a bully. That changed uh, with somebody by the name of Mark Driscoll, uh, who was the former pastor of Mars Hill Church. Um, people who listen to this podcast regularly have heard a lot about Mark, Mark Driscoll. In fact, he's continuing to bully. But but what happened with him that was so, you know, kind of changed the whole landscape when it comes to this bully pastor phenomenon? Yeah, so it, it, it did become uh, an ability to, to fire because the person was, is a bully. And uh, what happened with Driscoll is that he had been a bully for a long time uh, because I've spoken with people, uh, you know, kind of behind the scenes of, of what happened there at Mars Hill. And I'm currently speaking with people who are at Trinity who are experiencing mm. the same behavior. But what happened with Driscoll, and this is really important to understand, is that though people tolerated his bullying for a long time, there wasn't a lot of evidence. And what I believe got him ultimately in trouble is that though, like I said earlier, not all liars are bullies, but all bullies are liars, is that they just couldn't hide anymore. And documentation came out about working their way onto his way onto the New York Times bestseller list with tithe money, as I understand. Uh, for personal <laughs> right, benefit. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, and when people saw that, it's like, okay, this person, you know, could no longer keep up the game. They couldn't keep the house of cards going because there was documentation. So I say to that, to anyone who's watching and listening, it's very important to document as best you can. If you decide to take on a bully pastor, uh, documentation is extremely important. And again, that's what got Driscoll in trouble. And then if you can, don't go alone. Uh, there's a great mm. Greek proverb that says only the gods are courageous in isolation. Uh, and studies show, uh, Solomon Ash conformity study, for example, shows that when we have someone standing by our side, yielding to negative peer pressure drops to about 6%. So it's amazing mm. to have someone standing by your side. And I understand, too, that back when Driscoll was at his height, so it would have been right around, what, 2012, 13, 14, somewhere, you met with him. And I'm very curious what that meeting was like and what Driscoll, you know, how he came across to you. <laughs> yeah, it was a private dinner. Um, it was about eight or 10 people. It was right after he uh, preached there up in Seattle. I would say the only uh, good thing about the meeting was the steak. It was very good. <laughs> <laughs> and then he paid for it. So that was even better. Um, uh, yeah, I was, I just was blown away. My wife was with me. He was at the height of his powers. Um, I expected to hear things interesting. I heard just a lot of 
repeating of slogans. Uh, one was, it's, it's, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And he was very uh, aggressive and confrontational. Uh, I would say even rude. And I think it's very safe to say that he had believed his own press releases. Uh, I would, it's safe to say that the popularity had gone to his head. In fact, after that meeting, it's a long story short, my wife and I didn't get a chance to talk for a few hours. <laughs> we, we got into a car because I was speaking down uh, in San Diego, I believe. I uh, flew down there. We get into the car. We looked at each other like, what just happened? Uh, mm. You know, this guy's supposed to be a pastor. Uh, you know, I used to work for a chamber of commerce. And so I've worked with politicians and they have egos. Really? <laughs> by far, by far, I've never met a pastor with a bigger ego. It was it was stunning. So so when I you know learned about the fall of Mars Hill, I wasn't mm -hmm. surprised at all because pride goes before a fall. And many what we don't understand, we laymen in the church, is that it's often arrogance and narcissism and pride and hubris that makes a person a bully. It is not brokenness that makes a person a, an abuser. It's arrogance and pride that makes a person an abuser. And we know, and here's how we know, people with low self-esteem don't take chances. They, they cannot stand public speaking. They don't like exposure. They just wanna make it through the day. Abusers take a lot of risks and particularly abusers within the church, they love standing on stages. People with low self-esteem cannot stand being on a stage. So it's, it's hubris, not self-hatred, that leads them to do what they do. That's so interesting that you say that. And I remember reading that in, in your book, what was it, um, Free Us From Bullies. Uh, this whole idea of there being the wounded bully. And from my experience reporting on James McDonald, for example, who I was always told very close relationship with Mark Driscoll. In fact, they said uh, James was kind of like the big brother to Mark. And and you thought they were bad individually. The, you know, people that saw them together said it was, you know, just like on steroids. But yeah, he had, I mean, if you listen, if you see his, even now, he's a victim. He's always a victim, right? And yeah. But it's also in our popular, our movies, our literature, like like all of the the bullies and the victims, and, and there's got to be truth to this. I mean, a lot of people who offend and become, you know, awful people uh, had bad things happen to them as kids. I mean, that, that does happen. But you say this idea of sort of the wounded bully that's really been fostered in our culture, that's not really true. There's a mount of research that actually says otherwise. Uh, and, and one of the best, I believe, is a book called Almost a Psychopath. And in this book, and I, I write about it in my book as well, uh, they explain around 50% of a given population is malevolent. And when you look back, you look into their history, uh, they don't have any more uh, abuse than any other group of people. And it's very similar, Julie, to pedophilia. You know, there was a time a long time ago, uh, about 20, 30 years ago, that we thought, well, the reason a person becomes a pedophile is that they were sexually abused. That's how, I mean, why, how else would they do it? But studies show only about 25% at the most pedophiles hmm. were sexually abused. And it's very similar to bullying in the sense where uh, we thought that pedophilia was a crime of opportunity. It's not, it's a crime of habit. A pedophile will take a job all the way across the United States for years to get access to children. This is what they do, they plan their attack. Hmm. Bullies are the same way. Bullies plan their attacks against other people. If you've ever noticed, for example, Julie, when a, uh, an adult bully uh, enters a room, they often have an accusation on their tongue right when they walk through the door. That's on purpose. Hmm. They're planning their attack on the person ahead of time. So it really is a crime of habit, not necessarily opportunity. And there's plenty of studies showing Again, that your average bully is not broken. Uh, it, they're just full of themselves. And they also have, as I understand from, from reading you, um, contempt. And I've seen that too. I mean, uh, just a, an absolute contempt for certain people and for people in general where they just vent. 
They do. Uh, and, and so we often think that they're angry and they can be, but anger isn't necessarily at the root of why they bully. It's disdain and contempt for other people for real or perceived differences. Now that's often the case in adolescent bullying. What you have with adult bullying is disdain and contempt because someone stands in their way. Uh, your mm. average bully is a narcissist and narcissists are very good at kissing up and kicking down. So this helps us understand why a bully pastor, for example, will be warm and charismatic in one setting and then horrendous in another because they're duplicitous. Uh, it's mm. the simulation that they are very good at and they hone their skills at a young age. I would, I would bet money that James McDonald and Mark Driscoll and others were very good at honing this skill at a young age. So by the time they get older, I mean, many people just don't know how to handle um, such a person. Uh, it, yeah, and so they, narcissists often see people as below them or a threat. And that is the world in which they that's how they view people. And I get that in the world. I get that. Uh, it's, it's dangerous in the world. But to have that in the church is such a recipe for not just harm to an individual at that time, but it has a pedigree. It harms the reputation of the church with these people. And I, I just have to say that we have to stop the adulation. These people are, mm. uh, again, roughly this 15%. They hunger for adulation. They hunger for it. And unfortunately, within the megachurch structure, we have a situation, a dynamic, where we provide plenty of adulation. Uh, and I was one of those people at one time, so I'm not throwing stones. Uh, but I woke up and I, I realized in my anti-bullying work, that I was part of the problem, that I was helping to set up a pastor for a larger fall than, than, than was necessary, that I was lifting them higher and higher in my mind and even my words to them. Uh, and as a result, I was one of like many hands lifting the person really high and, and I believe being part of that fall. You know, we're all responsible for our own behavior, but I'm responsible for this adulation that I provided as well. So I've come to a conclusion. I will not show adulation to a pastor. I will pray for them. I will compliment mm. them, but I'm not going to put them on a pedestal because I don't want to be part of the problem anymore. Hmm. Well, that's interesting you say that. And I know you do have a background with Applegate, and I'd, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. And in full confession, um, in the late 80s, early 90s, my husband and I went to Willow Creek and although I will say, when we first got there, Don Cousins, the associate pastor, was preaching, and we loved Don. And when Bill Hybels came, we were like, who's this guy, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but I know how that is. I mean, it's, it's a big stage. We'd never seen this before. I saw, and, and I experienced uh, having, I was in sales at the time. I had a sales job before I went to grad school, you know, to make money for school. And, and I saw a lot of people. Uh, become believers through us bringing them to church. I mean, we used to fill two rows on a Wednesday night for their midweek services. It was it was exciting to see that happen. But I had no idea, although I'm, I'm glad I didn't, I, honestly, I'm glad I didn't find out when I was that age what was actually going on behind the scenes, because that would have rocked my world. By the time I found out, you know, I'm in my 50s, I'm a little more capable of dealing with it. But um Talk about your experience, because it was when you were in your 20s, right, that you were at yes. Applegate, where John Corson, who, um, folks, if you haven't heard of John Corson, uh, I've been I've been publishing on him for the past few months. Uh, Rebecca Hopkins is a reporter. It's been doing the investigating incredible work on uh, the corruption there and some sexual misconduct. But you were there in your 20s. Describe what that was like and kind of how you got sucked in. And, and as I understand it, Corson, John Corson, is not a bully like uh, a Driscoll, who's kind of a rough, hyper macho kind of redneck kind of guy. Um, Corson's, I mean, comes across extraordinarily winsome, right? He has great presentation. If you, for example, if you were to listen to Chuck Smith and you listen to John Corson, extreme uh, um, similarities there. Uh, mm -hmm. He, Corson, is very good at being critical, but with a smile in his eye and a lilt in his in his voice. I was at Applegate uh, when it, it was at its height, really, uh, or close to its height. And that's where I met my wife. 
And uh, I was a transplant. I moved down to Southern Oregon from Hillsboro, Oregon. And of course, it was the it was the place to go. It's the closest you're going to get to a kind of a celebrity culture. So you just you just drive out there and you follow all the cars and you go there. And I, I heard this person speaking and um, met my wife there, like I said, and we get married. And then after a while, though, it, it just some of the stuff just wouldn't add up. It would be I, I call it the things that made you go hmm. And I heard in the way he would describe uh, himself and indeed his family in such glowing terms. Uh, for example, a uh, tragic situation when his, his daughter died, I think her name was Jessica, mm. and there was a service there. And he and his family are on the stage and it's a very emotional time. And he said something that I, I couldn't forget. He had said that it was probably a good thing, um, or, or rather there was a silver lining, I should say, to her, uh, her passing. And she was only 16, I believe. And, oh. and that was that she would never uh, be able to find a man spiritually mature enough for her. Your 16 year old daughter. I mean, I know we all, I mean, I'm a father too of a daughter. And of course we joke about how no one is good enough for our, our, our daughters, but mm -hmm. I don't know anyone who really believes that. He actually believed that when he said that. And, and this was his example of how spiritually mature she was. That the day before, the, or maybe the morning of the tragic accident, that um, she had found numbers in the Old Testament that somehow aligned with numbers in the New Testament. And that was the example of spiritual maturity that he gave. And I, th I th that that isn't what the Bible says. <laughs> the Bible mm -hmm. says that spiritual maturity is mature love, agape love, a deep and abiding love. This is a person who literally thought that there wasn't a person in America, indeed the world, who could who was the spiritual match for his 16 year old daughter. That's just mm -hmm. one example that uh, I saw mm -hmm. up there that made me think this isn't right. This isn't this isn't how normal people think I, I think what happens with these celebrity pastors uh, John Corson being one of them again is they just believe the press releases they believe the adulation and it really goes to their head in a profound way and then when you have the seed of narcissism which according to a former pastor there Steve Hopkins has come out and said publicly John Corson is a narcissist um, it, it's just even worse and Pride goes before a fall, and I think that's what we're seeing more and more. And like you say, it was very winsome in public, but in private, you got to see a side of him that was a little different when you were involved, because you were a radio host at the time, right? And there's something yeah. going on with the sale of the station. I don't know exactly, but tell me what he was like when you encountered him in private. Yeah, so I would hear a gentle Jesus, meek and mild uh, message on Sunday, and then I was I was the program director and the news director of the radio station that they bought, mm -hmm. and um, so I would see how members acted on Sunday, or rather Monday, and you know, in psychology is called uh, cognitive dissonance, where uh, I had this idea of how they were because I thought I saw on Sunday, but I saw how they behaved on Monday. And mm -hmm. Julie, I just have to tell you, it was stunning. Um, rude, accusatory, mean, mm -hmm. even nasty. I remember being hung up on um, uh, from Corson. I, I was apparently not important enough to talk to him. And uh, he's very rude uh, on the phone as, as well. And, and definitely, you know, you hear the winsome on Sunday, but there's a whole new personality on, on Monday. And today, what we would do, Julie, you know, people would record that behavior and, and probably post it. And I highly recommend that people do that. But back then, we didn't have, you know, smartphones or anything like that. You just kind of had to sit there and take it. And, uh, oh, no, I, I saw a whole nother world. Um, mm. and, and which brings you to a different conclusion. You know, you and I are in a certain... Uh, lane uh, in regard to ministry. And one of the reasons I'm in that lane, and, and I, I'd assume you as well, is, is because we've seen things and we know things. And though we don't want them to be true, they are mm -hmm. true. And people are harmed 
because of it. Yeah, that that's really is true. And once you find those things out, you can't unlearn them, right? I mean, you know they're there. We're responsible uh, to our Lord uh, for the truths you know that we know and and the skills we have. And I know right now you're working with some people from Applegate, some victims uh, over the years. And you uh, explain that a little bit and and how that work is going and. Um, and I know there's a survivors group now that's, I don't know what it's pushing in about 400 on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's uh, interesting and I don't know this for sure, but there are people in that group where there's maybe a hundred, 150 people at a, at a service. And think about this. There's around 400 people in the Facebook group that say they're survivors of some degree of abuse. I mean, there are almost twice as many people in that Facebook group than, than, than who may go to an average service. That tells mm. you something. Yeah, I have been able to uh, uh, be part of that. It was, I've been asked to uh, help with people uh, who, have been ex- who have experienced abuse and uh, need help finding their way through many of the lies. It's one of the hardest things to overcome. Uh, hmm. Abusers always lie. They always lie about a person's value, uh, dignity, hmm. and worth. They don't. They don't go after necessarily job performance. They go after the person themselves. It's a big difference between tough leadership and abusive uh, leadership. Hmm. There, and one of the things that I've tried to do, given my experience there at the radio station, where I was there every day, every day, and I saw this behavior not just once, not just twice, regularly. And mm-hmm. what I've been doing with that group is by telling my story about what I saw, that it gives mm-hmm. courage to others to tell their story. And, and that's been my intent in many of my writings. It isn't necessarily to go after a person. It's not my nature necessarily uh, to do that. But if I need to write certain truths in order to give other people the courage to speak up and then thereby uh, establishing a pattern of behavior, is what abuse is, then I'm willing to do it and I've done it. And I'm glad to say that some of what I've written in that group and on my own Facebook page has given other people courage to, to speak up. I mean, there are uh, reportedly uh, a number of, of women who have had uh, bad experiences on a sexual nature up there. Um, And what's stopping them isn't their knowledge. It isn't that the it it isn't the emotion what stops them. It's often the courage to act upon what they know and what they feel. So my hope has been to help them uh, overcome that fear and uh, and find their courage because courage is almost as contagious uh, as fear. Hmm. That's true. And that's why whenever I report I begin an investigation, I report that first story, then people get emboldened and I, and I get more and more and more people coming out of the woodwork and they, they do, they, they strengthen each other. And I know just yesterday, uh, I read an article that the, well, actually I'm in contact too with some of the survivors of, uh, sexual, uh, rape and assault, uh, at Liberty university. And the, the case, the Jane Doe case against them has grown from like 10 or 12 to now they have 22. So Mm -hmm. these women are are becoming emboldened and and it's encouraging to see. And and yet there is sort of a phenomenon, I think. And as you're saying, people get so beat down, especially if they stay, if they're in the inner circle at one of these churches where there's a bully pastor. And depending on how long they're there, I mean, I talk to people that one guy, he was more than 10 years out of harvest. His counselor said, how often do you think of James McDonald? And he said, I know it's at least seven times a week. Because he said, yeah, every day he comes to mind. And this is 10 years after and after years of counseling. So there, there is a phenomenon there. And I know you recently spoke at Harvest Christian Academy, which is associated with Harvest Bible Chapel. Um, and I, I mean, I can imagine what it must be like there in the wake of COVID and also yeah. what happened with James McDonald, the whole implosion there. But what was the environment like when you spoke? They looked like they had been through a war. I, I, I've done, well, I'm sure we have trained over 10,000 teachers uh, at this point, mostly in North America, but throughout the world uh, as well. So I've done a lot of teacher training. And I know sometimes mm-hmm. at the end of the day, people are pretty tired. So I know how to handle that and, and hopefully get them interested and, and uh, stay connected. 
there was hardly any of that uh, there because they were so beat down. They mm. they look like a, you know a dog that had been left outside in the heat without water, and um, I heard horror stories of what not just the uh, James, but I believe is uh, one or, or uh, his son. Two, uh, Luke. Yeah, yeah, it, it's <laughs> yeah. a it's a family trait, uh, apparently, mm-hmm. of what of what I heard uh, there. And one thing that I can't forget, Julie, was at the very beginning of my presentation, because many of these teachers attended the church at that time, and I I said to them that no serial bully should ever be allowed back into the pulpit ever, and. I saw people physically shake when Mm. I said that. Now, I've said that many times in other settings and uh, also during community night, but I hadn't seen that in a teacher training. And so I thought, boy, I may Mm. have messed up. So I went up to my my, uh, lead person there, the headmaster, and I said, you know, do you remember when I made that statement? And I, I saw people shake and she said something profound. She said that, they had never heard a person in authority say that. And it became physically noticeable how powerful that was. And she said how helpful it was for someone mm. to hear that. And I think therein speaks to what we've been talking about. And, and that is the lies that bullies tell other people. And they get you to um, question your own sanity they get you to believe that you're less than you currently are. And for some people, that is debilitating to the point that they don't recover. They just don't recover from that short of a miraculous experience with our Lord. They will be wounded for the rest of their lives. I appreciate that you said that about bullies, because what I'm noticing in the church is that we want to replatform them as, as soon as they're done because, I mean, they're a commodity, right? They've got a huge platform. Yeah. Publishers know they can make money with them. Church networks know that this is uh, somebody they can put up at a conference and he'll still attract a crowd. We've seen uh, Mark Driscoll go back uh, and, and get his platform back at Trinity Church. As you said, he, he's just reoffended. You mentioned somebody in your book, uh, Darren Patrick, who yeah. sadly was replatformed and then committed suicide. A very tragic story. Um, I have a story about Darren that I may never publish because of what happened, but from people who knew him after his supposed restoration, and he wasn't restored, c- according to them. And why is it that we're so quick to put these guys back up on a platform and and we have churches like I just I just did a story about the Association of Related Churches and um, these pastors at the lead of this organization, one of the biggest church planning organizations in the country in North America, they're they pride themselves on replatforming fallen pastors. This is systematic abuse. A serial bully should never be allowed back into a pulpit. They don't change. They are very good at pretending to change. They're very good at telling people what they want to hear. But as soon as the power and consequences are taken out of the theater, they will just revert back to what they've done before. It happens so many times that we are negligent that we who support them, who who tie to them, who say great things about them, we're culpable. We Mm. need to change how we view it. And I think one reason why we, well, we've been, we've been taught about second chances and about redemption. And of course, we should have that and we should do that, but we need to be wise how we apply those particular scriptures. These people don't change. Once they have gotten to at a certain level of adulation, uh, the income is profound. As I understand it, when Driscoll left Mars Hill, I think he the, the fall, that tax year, he made something like 
over $800,000 after destroying what is, uh, to some degree, and some could argue, a denomination. That's not suffering for Jesus, people. I mean, mm -hmm. few people ever make that kind of money and after destroying a church. They don't change. We must know that moving forward. And our Lord doesn't need them. He doesn't need them. So, uh, and another mistake we make too, Julie, we're too slow to act. We're too quick to forgive. It's a, it's mm -hmm. a cheap forgiveness as uh, similar to what we might call cheap grace. And I think we do that because we want the conflict to go away. We don't understand the mindset of a true serial abuser. We don't understand that as soon as we're not looking, they'll go back to the, what they've done before. Uh, and and so we need to be better educated, those of us who in the in the uh, pews, and particularly those of us who are part of the leadership structure of that church. Bullies don't change. And you say the number one quality that bullies need is humility. Um, that's a hard thing to acquire. Pride is a difficult thing for all of us, right? I mean, let's be honest. It's it's like the first sin um, is, is pride. Uh, and you have a, a phenomenal quote, actually, by by Mark Driscoll, where he says, humility is the great omission and failure in my 11 years of preaching. I believe that this is my greatest oversight, both in my example and in my instruction. I therefore do not claim to be humble. I do not claim to have been humble. I am convicted of my pride. Unfortunately, it, it doesn't seem to have been exercised from him in all these years since then. They need humility. But as bystanders, which is what a lot of us are, right? We're watching this. We're, and you, you've alluded a little bit to this as well. But what character quality do we need and what responsibility do we have to do in something? You know, there comes a point where we know what we're seeing is wrong. We get that feeling in our gut, for example. We know something's not right. I had that feeling many times uh, at Applegate while listening to uh, John Corson. Um, we often feel uh, that things are wrong. But what happens is what we really need to do is find the courage to act upon what we know and what we feel. We must find the courage to be uncomfortable. We have to find the courage to be unpopular. And um, one thing we don't fully understand or are probably ever been taught is that the, uh, well, we know that the opposite of courage is cowardice. But what most people in the church don't know is that cowardice is listed as a sin in Revelation 21.8. Um, mm -hmm. Cowardice is listed as a sin. So many of us, who, uh, for example, may want to do something, but we say we're waiting patiently upon the Lord. And I've, that's what's happening now in many of the people from Applegate. They, I know they know things. Uh, I've spoken with them, but they're mm -hmm. waiting patiently upon the Lord. That's innately problematic when it comes to abuse, because these are portal moments. Um, they don't last forever. There is a critical mass mm -hmm. that forms, and Julie, you, you probably know it better than anyone. Yeah. And after a while, that critical mass uh, dissipates, and the courage that you could get from other people, the uh, inspiration that you could get from other people, eventually people go on with their lives, and uh, it dissipates, and it kind of melts into the soil. I believe that when people say they're waiting patiently upon the Lord, for some of those people, if not many of them, they're actually covering up the sin of cowardice. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we got to find our courage. We got to find our courage. And and another thing with the with the uh, uh, victims of abuse, we often think that what they need is love. I have come to the understanding of working with many many bullied children that. First and foremost, abused people don't need love. Not first and foremost, they need hope. Mm. Beleaguered mm. individuals and, and indeed beleaguered communities need to have some belief that tomorrow, next week, next month could be better. And a lot of that hope comes through the strength of other people. We're told in the greatest of all mm. commandments in Mark, to love the Lord our God and our neighbor through um, our, our mind, through our reason. Uh, we're told to love them uh, through our heart, our emotions. 
but we're also told in Mark to love other people through our strength, through our strength. Mm. The courage and strength are almost synonymous in scripture. And in fact, many of the key scriptures, they appear in the same sentence, uh, if not the same paragraph. We get that at 1 Corinthians, for example. So what people who have been harmed, what they really need is hope. And that hope often comes through the uh, portal of courage of other people. Well, and that's one reason we're doing a, a conference. We did our first conference, Restore Conference, in 2020, 2019. Um, and it was right on the heels of what happened at Harvest Bible Chapel. And wow, I mean, it was just so powerful. People coming together, sharing their stories, and the, the sense of the Holy Spirit, the presence of Him coming. I mean, when you're, when you're wounded and you're hungry— God seems to really inhabit those places, and and He did. It was amazing, and and people um, were ministered in just such a profound way. And we're doing another one coming up, but because of COVID, we haven't been able to do anything. Um, but in May, in fact, uh, if you're listening, you'd like to come. It's just uh, go to our website, restore2022.com, and uh, you you can sign up for that. But I know Lori Ann Thompson, who's a victim of Ravi Zacharias. Um, she powerfully you know, posted this video for us where she talks about how those of us who are wounded, you know, we have, we're, we're, we're hanging onto our faith by a thread, a lot of them, and we need to come together and hear the testimony of each other and, and to really minister to each other. And, and a lot of people have said to me, well, can I do this online? And I'm like, man, there's just something that doesn't happen online that happens face to face. And so, yeah. you know, I, I just encourage people to, to find those communities where you can find that kind of support and encouragement. And I just want to, you talked about hope. And I think that's something that right now is, is hard for a lot of us. I mean, there's days where, you know, frankly, I feel very despairing about the state yeah. of the church. And, and I feel like, you know, I look at evangelicalism, and this is my tribe. I grew up in this. I've, you know, given my life to the church, and I think, you know, is there hope? Can can we recover from this? Uh, it just seems like every week there's scandal after scandal after scandal, and there's people occupying the pulpit who don't have the character to be elders in a church. So sp speak to that. I mean, do you think we have hope? that this is going to rectify itself. And I agree that face-to-face -face, uh, conversation, especially if someone's been abused, when I mm -hmm. do community night or parent night, I now uh, put in an extra at least half hour, and sometimes it goes for an hour, where I uh, hear people's individual stories. They, they gotta get them out. If they trust you and they think you've got wisdom that you can help them, <laughs> It leaks. It's like hydraulic brakes. I mean, eventually it just, mm. it just spews out of them. And it's such an important time of ministry. It's a cleansing time uh, because you think you're crazy. When you get bullied and you get abused, uh, you believe the gaslighting, the love bombing, all the other things uh, that people will do to you. And it's it's evil, uh, and you need help getting that. It's like being, it's like it's like a poison. You need help getting the poison out of your system. I have mm. a functioning hope. I have to say, I don't have an emotional hope. I have more of an intellectual hope, um, given what I know of our Lord um, and how much he loves his church. And how, but more so, I mean, we, we're used to say, saying that um, he loves his people more than the building. And because of that, I, I know he will continue to work. I think it was Augustine who, uh, who talked about the... Um, the will of God and the will of man. And he gave the wonderful analogy of a person riding a horse. And when a, when a rider is so in tune with the horse that they're riding, you don't know which one is spurring which, which other one further. Uh, they're so melded together. And I say that to say that there are two wills involved in regard to the cleansing of the church. We know our Lord is there because we know he is a God of justice and fairness and mercy and humility. But I'm not seeing the will of man there. We need to get on that horse and we need to start riding together and we need to find our courage more. Because the longer this bleeding takes place, the lessened 
reputation of the church takes place, a blowout is always better than a slow leak in personal relationships Mm -hmm. and in regard to the nastiness that can be taking place at the church. The blowout is better. There's less pain and suffering and a bad reputation on the other side. So there's my functioning hope, um, which requires to some degree that people get off their blessed assurance, find their courage, and, and, and take part in the kingdom of heaven. That's really, I believe, what's missing. Our Lord's will is always there. That's so true. And I have hope too. I think the functioning hope, that's a good way of putting it, because I think emotionally, a lot of us aren't there. Um, although at times I can be. And I do think that uh, in, in the words of Marilla from Anne of Green Gables, to despair is to turn your back on God. And oh. I do think, you know, we know from Scripture that God has said that the gates of hell will not prevail over his church. Does that mean that this is going to be, I think that we're, it doesn't mean we're not going to have a very messy season. And I think we're in for not just a few years, I think we're in for a decade or more because the structures that have been built around a lot of the the propping up of this. I agree. I agree, sadly. But I appreciate what you're doing uh, so much and the voice and support that you've been uh, to me and my work, uh, really encouraged by getting to meet you and, and being able to, to interact. And, and I think uh, what you're doing is so important. And so I, I thank God for you. And I thank God that there are people like you uh, who are in the fight and wanting to see the church reformed and wanting to see us do good and and be the people of God. So thank you, and thank you for, for taking the time today. This has been great. Well, Julie, everything you just said it goes right back to you. I'll just give you a big ditto because I, I feel the same way. And uh, I know, too, the weight of, of I, I think, you know, trying to wake people up, I guess, uh, to show them things they don't mm-hmm. want to see. And uh, there is that casting well, yeah, you're casting pearls before swine in the sense where um, not only will they turn around and it, they'll trample them underfoot and turn around and, and attack you. I have experienced it most of my writing career, and I, I'm confident you have as well. So continue the good fight. There will be crowns uh, in or jewels in your crown in heaven for the work that you've been doing. Oh, well, thank you. Same to you. And thanks so much for listening to The Roy's Report, a podcast dedicated to reporting the truth and restoring the church. I'm Julie Roy's. If you'd like to connect with me online, just go to Julie Roy, spelled R-O-Y-S dot com. Also, just a quick reminder to subscribe to The Roy's Report on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or also on Spotify. And then if you would, help us out by leaving a review. We'd really appreciate that. And then please share this content on social media so other people can hear about it. Again, thanks so much for listening to The Roy's Report. Hope you have a great day, and God bless.